here we are today to kind of you know go through avian influenza. And I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about what avian influenza is and or influenza is in general, and then um, you know the various things that we see with the the avian influenza, and then a little bit of time on what we're seeing here in Washington. Um, and but yeah, again, totally open for for questions. And folks, you know, just raise your hands or interrupt me if you if you want to jump in and add anything or um, ask any questions. Can I move this? Yes, I can. There we go. Get that done out of the way so that you guys don't have to see that. Um, so there are four different types of influenza in general. Um, when we, you know, when we talk about in birds, obviously we're talking about avian influenza, which is typically influenza A. Um, humans, birds, handful of others. Uh, if you go to the CDC's website, um, they'll, you know, there's a whole long list of of different mammals and um, species that can be infected with avian influenza. When we talk about um, the seasonal flu in humans, it's typically this influenza A, uh, H1N1, to, you know, the the things that we get vaccinated for basically um, on a human level is influenza A. Influenza B. Uh, pretty much only infects humans, and it is also associated with the seasonal flu, though to a, a much, much lower extent, um, but it is, it can be associated with seasonal flu uh, pandemics. Influenza C only infects humans, um, and it has really super duper mild infections. Like it's not even really a, an epidemic or um, a pandemic or any level of anything really in humans. Influenza D is a relatively new influenza that was described um, since 2015. Uh, to date, there have been no human cases. They found it in pigs and cows, um, but no human cases. Uh, so yeah, so four, four main types of, of influenza. Um, from here on out, we're really going to be focused on the influenza A, uh, which is you know what bird flu falls falls into. And so influenza A really is the most significant, primarily because of its threat to humans. It can cause major, major illness in humans. Um, you know, millions of people globally a year die from excuse me, flement from influenza. Um, the strains for influenza A tend to be named by um, their surface proteins, right? So you have this hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, um, 18 different types of the hemagglutinin and 11 of the neuraminidase. And these different um, surface proteins on the virus help the virus invade the host cell. So I think we're all pretty familiar with the spike protein and SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Uh, these, these things on the surface of the influenza cell are pretty much, they do the same thing, right? They help the the um, virus bind to the host cell and then enter the host cell and do its spiral thing and replicate in the host um, in the host cells. Different strains can infect people differently. I think again because of the ongoing COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, we're quite aware of um, how different strains of the same virus can have different effects on on the host. And that's very true for influenza A as well. And it's also true for, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, for avian flu, right? So different strains of, of avian flu affect the hosts differently. Um, so how do we, well, I think I'll, we'll, yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so yeah, in birds, there's 16 of the um, hemagglutinin and nine of the neuroamidase. Those are all what we would consider avian influenza. Um, interestingly enough, there's H17 and H18 only ever found in bats. Um, it's kind of a side note, not really relevant here, but I thought it was cool. Uh, there are many, many, many different combinations of H and N, right? So you hear us say H5N1, which is a current um, outbreak in, in wild bird, well, birds in, in North America and Europe. Um, you can have H3N2, H, you know, H8N1, um, and that's one of the reasons why Influenza A is so can be so significant um, because it, it readily reassorts, it readily kind of mutates and changes itself, and so these different combinations of the of the H and the N, um, you know, can can not only can you have different a lot of different combinations of the 16H and the 9NA or the neuroamidase, but then they can recombine um, even more and, and genetically mutate. 
And so I think it's you know also really important just to keep in mind that all known subtypes of this influenza A can and do infect birds, except for the two bat varieties <laughs> that I just mentioned. Um, and to date, there's really only two subtypes that circulate in people, the H1N1 and H3N2. It changes, right? We all know that the flu vaccine that we get sometimes is not a very good vaccine, and that's because of the reassortment and the genetic mutations that occur in influenza A. And so it's it's a constantly changing and evolving virus. Um, it does circulate in a lot of different animal groups, like I mentioned, and it can cause epidemics, which you know is one of the reasons why we're all you know, can be really concerned about it from a human health perspective. I do want to highlight the zoonotic risks of avian flu. Uh, typically, uh, the, the risks are, are not that great. Uh, we tend to think that most of the bird flu strains stay in birds and most of the human strains stay in humans. Um, and so, you know, while the influenza A virus is from birds, can infect humans, not all of the bird flu varieties infect humans. But um, it's really important to note that the 1918 pandemic that I think we're all aware of now that we're living through our own pandemic, H1N1, um, was from an avian uh, source. They, they did a bunch of genetic work and traced it back to an, an avian um, an avian origin. So it is important to keep it, um, keep that in mind. But, you know, it is, it's complicated if you really get into the weeds of what, you know, the, the different strain types of influenza A and avian flu really are. This is a diagram that I found from this, whoops, go back to that, from this um, Hormat et al. paper, which I'm happy to share with folks if you'd like it. Um, but basically, it was just looking at uh, several different strain types from 2018. This H, I do want to highlight this H5N1 is a different H5N1 than we currently see. Um, it was the Asian variety that was more prominent in 2015. Now we have the Europe or Eurasian variety that's really circulating. But it's just kind of, you know, it's kind of a cool diagram because it, it really highlights that the different strains have varying levels of um, impact on different species, right? So H5N1 can be pretty severe in, um, you know, ferrets or weasels and people, but, you know, more moderate in pigs. Uh, here in wild birds, it's mild moderate, but we now know that the European H5N1 is much more severe. Um, so, yeah, there's just all of these different types of avian flu or influenza A, and they, they do really um, infect different taxa differently. So a little bit more on the basics of avian influenza. Waterfowl are typically considered the natural reservoir of avian influenza uh, viruses in general, right? So all of the um, the influenza A that I talked about um, tend to circulate in waterfowl. They don't really tend to cause disease in wild birds unless the birds are immunosuppressed or have something else going on. Um, the high path AI strains obviously can be quite deadly, uh, especially for domestic birds. And in the past, it's now changing and becoming more deadly in wild birds, which I'll go into a little bit of detail here in a minute. Um, and again, just the recombination of the avian influenza strains with human influenza A is what is of really big concern, right? That's where the the risk of um, you know potential more you know more impact on humans is is potential. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit more about avian influenza in general and the differences between low path versus high path AI. Uh, low path avian influenza um, tends to so pathogenicity really is defined by the impact that it has on domestic birds, right? And pathogenicity is how severe is it? How sick does it make the animal or the human? Um, and so pathogenicity for avian influenza is defined based on its impact on domestic poultry. Uh, so low path doesn't really kill domestic birds uh, versus high path, um, you know, can kill up to 75 percent or greater. Sometimes it's closer to 90, 95 percent of infected domestic birds. Um, a lot of times it's 100 percent mortality because we cull here in the United States. Um, and of the, the hemoglutinase, uh, types that I talked about, H5 and H7, are the only ones that are considered to be high path. To make it more complicated, not all H5 or all H7 are actually high path. Um, they get flagged as potential high fat path, but 
it's, so even if it's a low path variety, as in it's not killing a lot of domestic birds, because they so rapidly mutate, um, H5 and H7 are, are generally considered to be high path when it comes to, to management and regulations and stuff. Um, and again, the human infections with high path avian influenza are really quite, quite rare. When they do happen, um, it's significant mortality rate. So over 50% mortality rate of those infected, which is quite stark. So how does avian influenza spread? Infected birds shed the virus pretty much in their saliva, nasal secretion, and feces. Um, the viruses themselves can survive in the environment for variable lengths of time. If you do a Google search to look for um, the data on this, it really depends on the environment. Um, you know, kind of cool, but not hot. Um, wet environments tend to, to harbor the live virus, can the, the virus can live in for up to several weeks. Um, more salt water, uh, colder, much colder, uh, will kill the virus, and then also a lot hotter um, weather and drier weather will kill the, the virus. And so, you know, earlier this summer when we had that nice, wet, cold spring, it was kind of the perfect environment, right, for allowing the virus to, to live uh, outside of the host. Uh, susceptible birds become infected when they have contact with the virus, so either through their eyes or their their nose, they inhale it, or most most frequently it's it's eaten, right? So most frequently it's like a fecal oral transmission route. So the I do want to highlight that the exposure and persistence of avian influenza, um, it really is, at least from what we know, it really is spread through fecal material. Um, and once that fecal material contaminates wetlands and, you know, especially in you know, situations like this where you have thousands upon thousands of, of waterfowl, um, the, you know, the, the virus can live in those environments for, for quite a while, several weeks at least, if not longer. Thankfully, um, avian influenza viruses are pretty easily killed by heat, drying, disinfectants. Um, you know, if you look at your bottle of bleach, it'll say effective against influenza viruses. That includes avian influenza, uh, but freezing does not kill the virus. So you can't just freeze a carcass and hope that the virus gets killed. So what are the symptoms of low path avian influenza? Um, again, in wild birds, we don't typically see symptoms of low path AI. It just kind of there, it circulates in them. There might be some mild symptoms, but not, you know, nothing really to, to worry about. Uh, same thing in domestics, you might see a, a mild uh, respiratory um, illness go through the, the flock, but you're not, you're not really gonna see significant mortality. Versus high path AI, um, and this is, this is, you know, symptoms in wild birds. If, if we're talking about domestics, there's a couple other symptoms you can add, but, you know, bluish skin, nasal or eye discharge, uh, maybe blood tinge, it may not be, um, head tilts, um, neck, you know, torticollis, the neck kind of turning back around, lack of coordination, depressed mentation. Basically, these things are neurologic symptoms, right? Um, ruffled feathers, sudden death is a, a big one. We've gotten a lot of reports recently of um, owls just literally falling dead out of the sky. Um, if you, again, if you're dealing with domestics, you might see unthriftiness, right? They just kind of might go off their feed and not, not be super um, interested in, in, whoops, in food. And you're gonna see a, a big decrease in the um, egg yield or egg production, uh, which is one of the reasons why high path AI is so important for our domestic agriculture, right? Because we have millions upon millions, not billions of dollars um, that are lost, economic loss during outbreaks of high path AI. So, and this is where it gets really interesting to me. Um, historically, high path AI infections were only associated with domestic birds. Um, so mortality, like we would detect high path AI in wild birds periodically, um, but we weren't seeing significant infections and or mortality and pathogenicity. There is this um, one exception where there was a, a die off of turns in South Africa in 1961, uh, but very, very little is known about that event. Um, and so it's kind of an outlier, but it is really interesting that historically we weren't really seeing much by way of mortality in, in wild birds with high path AI prior to 2002. And this is a, a really cool paper. Again, if anyone's interested in this paper, let me know. I can share it with you. Um, 
but Rami et al. 2022, it's hot off the presses, um, basically looking at this H5N1 as an emerging disease threat for wild birds. Um, and it kind of, it goes into the history um, of, you know, of H5N1 or HiPath AI in general. Um, and this is, you know, this is really the, the traditional, what they, what we used to think traditionally happened, right? So you had your wild birds where your avian influenza circulated in the waterfowl, um, they would spill over into these domestic birds, um, mostly the, you know, domestic uh, chickens or, or turkeys or something, they would mutate and become a high path avian influenza. And then when we saw mortality in wild birds, it would be because of spill back, right? So transmission back from agriculture. It wasn't really thought that the um, high path AI was circulating in wild birds. And again, you know, obviously the human, potential human spillover effects that I, I mentioned earlier too. And this is a, a figure from that Rami et al. paper that kind of shows um, the timeline for high path avian influenza in wild birds um, over time associated with specific, um, you know, the emergence of this H5N1 uh, clade 2.3.4.4, which is what we're dealing with here in Washington now, in Europe, and many, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of places in the world, unfortunately. And the the size of the circle indicates the number of individuals affected. And so, you know, there's a couple blips on the radar prior to the emergence of this clade, which has a bunch of different um, lineages of H5N1 in it. Um, but what you see is historically, there wasn't really much going on with high path AI and wild birds, right? Versus from about 2010 onwards, we are seeing, um, you know, not insignificant and, in, you know, potential impacts on, on wild birds and the emergence of this H5N1 in wild bird populations. I'm sorry, I have notes here for something I think I wanted to say. Uh, yeah, so I do want to say that the the 2014-15 H5N1 that was found in the United States was a different H5N1 than what we're currently dealing with. Um, the the big outbreaks that occurred then too were more associated with different clades, so H5N2 and H5N8, not just H5N1, um, and pretty pretty universally across North America now we are the the outbreak that we're seeing is still solely H5N1 2.3.4.4 from Europe um so we're not seeing multiple different strains with it or clades I forget the terminology it's very the genetics of, of influenza is very confusing for me so I apologize if I'm um not speaking in the correct terms for the genetics so I just wanted to highlight briefly kind of a super, super simplified history of high path AI here in the United States. Um, the very first documented case of high path avian influenza happened in 1924 um, from the East Coast in a live bird market. We then had, um, you know, a couple of, I think it was small blips of H5N2 and, and domestics in the Northeast in the 80s. Again, more H5N2. Uh, in 2004, and then this detection in 2014 was the very first. Um, and I, I, you know, I know this is a difficult thing for folks here because it wasn't a, a falconry bird. Um, the, the very first detection in a wild bird um, from Washington, Whatcom County here, and that was, you know, when we followed by this um, outbreak that kind of ballooned out a little bit from from this area and then the the big huge outbreak that we have ongoing which is pretty unprecedented um haven't seen anything like it really ever before in north america and it's you know mirrored in in europe and the the impacts there so this 2014-15 high path ai outbreak uh over 50 million domestic birds um were impacted in that outbreak um, most of them were called, and that tends to be the case, right? When we see these numbers of the domestic birds that died, um, the vast majority of them in those uh, these instances are called because that's been the primary mechanism for controlling high path AI in the United States is to just go in and call the domestic flock. Um, during this outbreak, there's only 99 wild birds total um, that that were detected that had high path AI, and by June um, of 2015, so you know six eight months later the virus had completely vanished from the United States. It was no longer detected um, across North America. 
And contrast, um, H5N1 2.3.4.4B, so the European strain of H5N1, um, has pretty much become an epidemic in, um, in Europe. And this is just from the um, EFSA scientific report from June to September. And all of these red dots are H5N1. You can see, sorry, it's really crappy. Um, I think that's H5N5. You can see there's a handful of other strain types of avian influenza, but the vast majority um, are this H5N1. Um, for Europe, there have been over 48 million birds called, and they've seen about 3,500 events in wild birds. Um, again, beyond just Europe, there's been a huge geographic extent of this H5N1 2.3.4.4B. Um, 37 European countries, it's been in Africa, it's been in the Middle East, it's been in Asia, it's now in North America. Um, you know, so it's it's pretty, it's different. This is a different, I think we're de we are dealing with something that is quite quite different. This strain of H5N1 in the United States showed up in, um, this is not an image from this, this is from uh, Turns and um, I think the Lake Michigan or somewhere uh, in the Midwest. But um, January of 2022 was when this strain of H5N1 was found in a South Carolina wild duck. Um, it's thought that water birds, waterfowl brought this virus to the United States from Canada. It had been documented in Canada. Um, prior to it being found in, in the United States. And since then, um, 3,400, and this was like a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, so this number is probably significantly higher now, just given the number of wild birds we're seeing affected. Uh, but 3,400 and counting wild birds have been found sick or dead so far. And that's, again, just complete stark contrast, right, to what we saw in 2014-15 with only 99 wild birds. Um, I also want to highlight that there was a harbor seal mortality event in Maine where several hundred um, harbor seals died from, from the strain of avian influenza. Here in Washington, we were the first to document um, it causing mortality in raccoons. Uh, fox have been documented with mortality, striped skunks. I do want to say that these three tend to um, the thought is that they were scavenging on sick and dead wild birds, and that's why, you know, they just had a really high exposure rate to the virus, and that's why they became infected. Uh, the harbor seals is a bit alarming, um, and, you know, it's, I'm really hoping we don't see any marine mammal mortalities here in Washington, but as you'll see in a couple of slides, we are starting to detect it in some of our um, marine, marine birds, so. Um, again, you know, the economic impact, if we think about, um, you know, the agricultural side, um, the economic impact's been pretty huge for the com commercial poultry and, and backyard flocks. Uh, the vast majority of, if you look in Washington, the vast majority has really been in backyard flocks. Um, I think we've only had maybe even... I don't, yeah, maybe we even haven't even had a commercial and just um, commercial entity affected yet in Washington that dot looks like it may be on the other side of the border. Um, and the economic impact is, you know, it's huge. It's to be determined how big it will be, right? But quite, quite large. Um, so here in Washington for this H5N1 European 2.3.4.4B strain of um, high path AI, our very first case came in March, the 1st of March, 2022, and a greater white-fronted um, goose from Walla Walla County. Um, after that, we have been seeing and monitoring reports of sick and dead wild birds. We submit cases pending funding uh, for testing. A huge number of our cases, you know, and the majority of our cases have come from working with our wildlife rehabilitators um, and working with them to get, to get cases submitted for diagnostic testing. Um, this is a map, it's not the best map in the world, but it's um, you know where we have had positive detections of high path AI in Washington. And I do wanna highlight that our, the data that we have in wild birds is extremely biased because um, outside of the work that the USDA is doing to do um, some healthy hunter harvested surveillance of waterfowl, uh, we really are, Washington, DFW is only surveying or only submitting samples from suspect cases, right? So um, these are all indicate or all points on the map are all from, you know, we get a call about a sick red-tailed hawk and it's either found dead or euthanized by a rehabilitator and then we take a swab sample and submit it. Um, 
and so you can see it's you know pretty pretty evenly distributed across the state. Um, I think there there's definitely some overlap with where our population centers are because that's where people are finding and reporting the sick and dead birds. Um, but you know it's 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 across Washington. Uh, sorry, this is really crappy um, resolution. But so this is um, just a screen capture of um, you know our our data system and some of the data data visualization that um, we have. So 62, that's actually inaccurate now because we have four pending positives. Um, so 66-ish of about 100 total cases tested. Um, and you can see this is, you know, the, the report submitted per day. And again, this is just, you know, simply from, you know, private citizens, wildlife rehabilitators, our biologists um, seeing sick and dead, uh, birds on the landscape and us submitting these. Um, and so you can see the big uptick and then there's kind of another uptick here. And I think if this goes on out until November, we're probably going to see another uptick there in the number per day. Though at some point we're going to run out of money. Um, this is the list of positives that we have in Washington. I do need to say that the American Coot and the Buffalo Head are pending. So these two are presumptive positive. But um, yeah, you can see that the you know we have a pretty wide range of of um, species affected here in Washington. Um, a lot of raptors, a lot of owls. Uh, we're starting to see some more seabirds, um, some more gulls. I've gotten multiple reports of sick and dead seagulls of various species. Um, so yeah, it's pretty a pretty large number of species have impacted. I want to highlight that there are um, several ongoing mortality events here in Washington. Unfortunately, um, specifically in Western Washington, we have one up in um, Weiser Lake in Whatcom County, where there have been about 160 dead geese, mostly geese, snow and Canadian, a handful of swans, um, you know, with this ocular opacity or white kind of white to their eyes. Um, neurologic symptoms, pretty sure it's, it's high path AI. We haven't, we're just submitting samples today. Um, and then there's a, um, a wildlife area down in, in Southwestern Washington outside of Vancouver that's also reported several, about 50, I think, dead um, and sick geese with pretty clear symptoms. Um, Oregon, I got an email from one of the wildlife vets in Oregon that has said that they've had over a thousand sick and dead waterfowl, mostly geese. Uh, snow geese and Canadians, a lot of cacklers, mostly cacklers, I believe, that are also um, exhibiting symptoms. Oregon's not testing quite as many wild birds as as we've been able to. Um, but so I think, you know, that unfortunately we may be at the beginning of what may be a very bad winter with all of the, the snow and Canadian and cacklers coming back. Uh, initially, when I put this presentation together, I had a you know, this strain is thought to be more deadly to wild birds, but I think at this point in time, I am pretty, pretty confident and feel pretty, pretty confident in making a statement that this strain of the, of the high path AI of the Eurasian H5N1 2.3.4.4.B is more deadly to wild birds. I think that that's, you know, I think we can make that, that claim at this point. Um, We don't, you know, there's, I, if you Google this, you're not going to find published papers on it, except for that Rami et al. paper I mentioned. But um, I think that the data are definitely there based on the number of reports and, and things that we're seeing here in Washington. And again, just to highlight, we do see H5N1 in mammals, which is um, important. Uh, could be a little bit alarming if it starts to mutate and evolve in mammals. Um, then it could become more, you know, more pathogenic or more infectious to humans and more pathogenic um, raccoons added here. But again, so far, the, these all the three, these three species, um, when they've been detected with high path AI, this strain of high path AI, it's been really close proximity to piles of dead geese or piles of dead birds in general that we know they're scavenging on. So um, the thought is they had a really high infectious dose from that, and that's you know, why they became infected. Uh, this is kind of a busy slide, but I think it's worth just mentioning because I, I mentioned some presumptive positives. So where, you know, what is confirmed? Um, because also if you look at our website versus the USGS's website versus the USDA's website, you might see varying numbers. The numbers may not agree for how many wild 
bird cases we have. Um, so when we get a sample or a you know suspect case and we decide to sample it, if it's PCR positive at Waddle, so the Washington Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory out of WSU and Pullman, if it's PCR positive, WDFW then considers that a presumptive positive. We initiate chains of communication with our partners. Um, since it's a potential zoonotic disease, we have to notify the Department of Health. We have to notify the Department of Ag, given its you know, potential um, importance to agriculture. So at this point, we pretty much consider it to be positive. Um, Waddle will send a sample to NVSL, which is a National Veterinary Services Laboratory with the USDA, and they are technically the only entity that can truly confirm it as high path AI. And so they'll do PCR, and at that point, they will confirm it. WDFW would then change our language from presumptive positive to positive, but for all you know, basically all that we do, we we treat a presumptive positive as positive. And the, you know, the the catch here is that this process can take days to get the results from Waddle. So we know it's PCR positive, but then several weeks to get this point, right? So um, given the importance and the time sensitivity, that's why WDFW, after the first handful of cases, well, the first like 30 cases, we were like, okay, we're pretty confident. There's never been a case where Waddle had a PCR positive and this happened, right? And VSL said, no, no, it's negative. That's that's never happened. Um, it always goes through, you know, this way basically a positive is ends up being a positive. At some point in time, PC, I suspect that the PCR positives, because Waddle's just doing an avian influenza PCR. So at some point in time, it may be that the PCR positive leads to not high path AI, maybe a low path AI or a different strain of high path AI. Um, but interestingly enough, we're, we're not there yet. I think a lot of us really expected to see a different strain come back with the birds when they came back from, from the Arctic um, and migrated back in because of the way um, avian influenza reassorts and, and mutates and kind of changes with, with time. Um, but we haven't seen that yet, and maybe we will as we move into the winter, but so far we haven't seen that. Okay, so last few slides here. Um, what to do with secondary bird reports. So WDFW is, unfortunately, we are running out of money um, for the second time for what samples we can process. Um, each sample is about 100 bucks to process, so I think the, the fact that we've already sampled you know over 100 birds is pretty great um but we are having to prioritize so at this point we're prioritizing raptors scavengers not so much waterfowl unless it's a really important area and species of greatest conservation need and or protected species um waterfowl if it's in a new area right so a new county um or this mass mortality event that I mentioned that's up in Wacom, uh, we are testing those because we want to verify that it is high path AI. Um, we, you know, if it's a, a case that may be of importance to our partners for whatever reason, we have zoo partners that are relying on us providing information for, for them and where we're finding wild birds with high path AI, you know, because they brought many, like if you go to the Woodland Park Zoo, their birds have been off exhibit for a long time now. Um, and so they rely on us to, to provide information for the safety of them taking their birds back out of quarantine. Um, and then some, sometimes there's you know a, a private citizen that's extremely concerned for whatever reason, and we'll, we'll sample those cases as well. Um, we swab, typically swab and dispose of the carcass. We are not doing full necropsies at this point in time. Um, high path avian influenza is considered a select agent by the USDA. So basically a, an agent of bioterrorism. And so um, if, you know, if a carcass has high path AI, we have to verify that it's been destroyed um, and it's just much easier to take the swab and then dispose of the carcass. Um, and we, we swab the coanal slit and the, and the cloaca. So how do you keep birds safe? I think this is the, the million dollar question, right? Um, biosecurity, I think you guys are all probably really, really good at biosecurity. Um, don't let them eat waterfowl or domestic birds. Wash your hands after handling live wild birds if you have domestics. If you go out for, at this point, if you go out for a walk around, you know, a lake that has a bunch of geese in it, I would clean my boots or change my clothes before I come anywhere near um, my birds. And then, you know, prevent contact with domestic birds and free ranging wild birds as, as much as possible. Um, 
you know, I think the, the, the prevalence of this H5N1 in, in wild birds right now is just crazy. I see um, the USDA is doing some, I mentioned earlier, doing some surveillance with um, hunter harvested uh, mallards and waterfowl in general, not just mallards. And the, they're seeing 95% prevalence in these in some of these birds, um, at least in the results that I've seen. And these are presumed healthy hunter harvested animals, right? And the, the prevalence is really, really quite high. Uh, what about vaccination? And I think, you know, if they're the other veterinarian from oops from California is here, I'd be awesome to have him jump in and talk more about this. Um, in general, there well, not in general, there are no available vaccinations in the United States. The reason for this is because of export import issues. Vaccinated historically vaccinated birds were not distinguishable from infected birds. And so the the USDA is just not allowed vaccination um, in this in this country. There have been um, some studies recently that have indicated that you know you can detect pretty very accurately, you can detect a, an immune response to a vaccine versus an immune response to a natural um, infection or an exposure to high path AI. Some European nations are also pretty actively investigating moving to a vaccination program, um, which I think would push the United States to go that route because it, of the, you know, the, that would lessen the impacts on import export uh, and trade regulations. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's good research that shows that vaccination protects falcons. And I know, Paul, I don't know if you want to jump in and mention the letter that's being written or submitted to the USDA asking for approval for vaccination or, or not. But I think this is a great point to stop and let others chime in. Uh, yeah, uh, if Bill Ferrier can uh, chime in, he's the one that actually wrote that letter that I, that I showed you that went from NAFA to the USDA, I believe. Are you still here, Bill? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, you know, for us falconers, H5M1 is not going to go away. I thought that after last year, it would burn out like it has in the past. It mm -hmm. hasn't. I think that everybody's been surprised that it's still hanging around. And everything that I've seen indicates that it's going to be around for a long time. And if it does go away, it's going to cycle back several years later. And for a lot of us, it kills us to miss a hunting <laughs> season. And so most of us are missing duck season this year. And I'm not sure how many duck seasons I have left in me. Um, but the, the key is getting our birds vaccinated. And as the... Um, uh, previous veterinarian, I uh, forgot her name, sorry, um, mentioned, you know, this is all about the poultry industry, the multi-billion dollar poultry industry, and the potential for a trade embargo on poultry products from the United States if vaccination is occurring here in the U.S. I can tell you that I know falconers in Mexico that are vaccinating for it. Um, I know they're vaccinating for it in the Middle East and even in Europe. Um, but the USDA takes the value of the poultry industry, you know, very importantly. And so as a result of that, they're doing everything that they can. That if we move forward to vaccination, that we can do it in a fashion that has no impact whatsoever on the poultry industry. So two weeks ago, there was a meeting in Paris. Um, the USDA was there and it was with the poultry stakeholders, international poultry stakeholders, and one of the topics was um, for the United States to be using um, a, a vaccine in non-poultry birds. And prior to my conversation with the veterinarian that attended that meeting, uh, falconry was not on the list. And fortunately, I caught her before she got to Paris. And so after that conversation, falconry raptors were um, on her radar. And so I've had several conversations with her since she came back. And um, where we're at with that right now, by the way, there's, there's several effective vaccinations. And the Lear's um, study that was, um, that was cited here, um, that particular study used uh, H5N2 vaccine, which can be easily distinguished from the H5N1. They did that in Saker falcons, and then they challenged 
the vaccinated Saker Falcons with the hot H5N1 um, influenza virus. And 100% of the Sakers that were vaccinated survived. And 100% of the birds that didn't get vaccinated died. So we know that vaccination is effective for them. Um, I was hoping, so I, in, in these conversations, one of the things that we had to do was to submit a letter to the head USDA veterinarian requesting authority to utilize the vaccine in captive raptors. So we wanted to go on record with that. So I drafted the letter and then I thought it would be best coming from Napa. So I sent it off to Martin Galise and, and they looked it over a little bit, made a couple of minor changes. And then Napa um, submitted that letter to the head USDA veterinarian. So that's in their possession and they're currently um, in the process of responding to us in that regard. But since then, this, the other veterinarian who's in charge of the vaccination stuff um, is back from Paris and I've spoke with her and um, the vaccination is just not gonna happen this year. What I've also learned is that the USDA is actually developing their own vaccine and they're in the process of testing it in raptors. And I made contact with the researchers two days ago and I've done a fair amount of vaccine research in raptors. And so I um, offered my help um, in terms of, um, you know, when they're, when they're thinking about sedentary birds in a, re in a rehabilitation center, um, they're not thinking about the athletic bird. And for our athletic birds, the type of um, adjuvant that's used in the vaccine, that an adjuvant is a, a material that stimulates the immune response. And if you use a, certain adjuvants and it has to go into the pectoralis muscle, the flight muscles, it's going to cause a lot of tissue necrosis. And that's something that we don't want happening. And so I wanted to make sure that the um, the scientists that are developing this vaccine that can be used in raptors in the United States um, understood that um, we need a vaccine that will not cause tissue necrosis and or one that can be administered subcutaneously and then we don't have to worry about the, um, the necrosis so much. So they're working on it right now. Um, before we will ever be able to utilize a vaccine in the birds, there's several criteria that we're gonna have to meet. Um, and so one of them is accountability for the vaccine. And what that means is that you're not gonna be able to order the vaccine from a vet supply house and administer it yourself. Every bird that gets vaccinated um, has to be uh, done so in a manner where it is tr uh, tracked. And it has to be, this, what they're saying is that once you vaccinate that bird for influenza, it has to be tracked for the rest of its life. Well, we sort of already do that with tracking our birds with 3186A um, forms. And so I've let them uh, know about that. The other thing um, is that um, in terms of accountability of the vaccine is that it, it's gonna have to be, the vaccine itself has to be um, stored in a controlled environment and, um, and documented. And so what I propose to them is that the vaccine um, be delivered to licensed veterinarians in, around the country. And then you as a falconer would make an appointment to get your bird vaccinated for influenza. You would go in there, they're maintaining the vaccine and the records for the vaccine. And you go in there, your bird gets vaccinated. And, and then the veterinarian is, um, taking care of all of the documentation um, and the health records. And health records are a real big part of what they're requiring. And essentially the standards that they're utilizing for what, how birds are gonna get vaccinated are the standards found, and you can look this up online, in the AZA, and that's the Association of Zoo and Aquariums. And before I responded the second round to their questions, um, I, I spent about three days reading through all the ACA standards. And fortunately, the majority of them are very similar um, to our 50 CFR 23, whatever is the federal falconry regulation. So, um, you know, we, I think that we're gonna be okay in that regard, but the, there has to be a, a proposal written by the USDA 
that is followed by anybody or a, a protocol, I should say, that's followed by anybody that desires to vaccinate their birds for highly pathogenic avian influenza. Uh, let me see what else am I? Oh, and the other thing is that the, that vaccine um, is going to have to be a USDA licensed vaccine. So the bottom line is to get all these things done this year, I think um, is not going to happen. But my hope is, and what I'm trying to do is lay the groundwork right now so that the next time around, it's all figured out. We know where the vaccine is going to go. And we, it's a matter of um, uh, getting the vaccine delivered to the veterinarians that are going to be administering it, getting it administered, and then go out and hawk ducks. Any, anybody have any questions about that? Thank you, Bill. That was very informative. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bummer, but it's, it's also hopeful. But you're welcome, and we're hanging on there and doing our best to um, get this taken care of. Yeah, that's that's super great information. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd be curious to know too the the role of the State Department of Ags in this. If it's not if if the USDA is, allows vaccination of falconry birds. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting because I think at that point you still have to, you might, I guess I should not say, you might have to have Department of Ag, like the state veterinary approval for that. I'm yeah. thinking about, um, you know, like for us in Washington, we use the rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus vaccine to vaccinate some of our wild rabbits. And we've had to get approval from our state veterinarian to do that. So I'm that glad you brought be... that up. And yeah. and that that's absolutely correct. So for us, it's the California... Department of Food and Agriculture, mm -hmm. and in my conversation with the USDA veterinarian, um, that is one thing that one other criteria that is going to have to be fulfilled. Once they approve it, then the falconry community needs to go to the state veterinarian to get approval to use the vaccine within their state. I'm really glad you brought that up, and mm -hmm. I have it written down on my list, so I forgot to mention it. <laughs> When I, I'll say for Washington too, when hopefully hopefully we'll get to that point sooner than later, when we do, um, and Jen jump in if I'm over speaking here, but when we do, I, I'd like to say that WDFW will help with that however we can, um, because I would also like to see us be able to vaccinate education raptors that are in rehabilitation facilities um, for the same reason, right, just to keep them protected. And so I think, you know, if there's something WDFW can do by partnering with Washington Falconers to try and, and get approval from the Washington Department of Ag, let us know. Are there any comments, questions, thoughts? Paul, looks like your hand's up. Yeah, I, got, I figured that out. Um, so um, I, I don't know, with conversations with Bill earlier, he, he mentioned that, um, there would be a prohibition for releasing a bird that was vaccinated. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. basically you'd be stuck with it your entire life because they don't want that out there. I'm just mm -hmm. wondering how that would uh, kind of coincide with the idea of vaccinating wild birds like endangered species and stuff like that. Yeah, and that is a fantastic question. That's a really good question. And I think that that may be something on our horizon, right? Because I, I absolutely agree with Bill that they, this H1, H5M1, is it's not going anywhere. I think if we look at what's happening in Europe, you know, we can say it's here. Unfortunately, it's here to stay. So I think, yeah, that's a great question, Paul, and something that um, WDFW should be thinking about even prior to the USDA having a vaccine available, because that would, that may become necessary. We got a hand Sorry, up from a, Josh. There. To say, Paul, that's a non-answer for you. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Josh. I, I was just curious of, have there been many infection rates documented in upland game bird that might share the same fields as waterfowl? That is a good question and not to my knowledge. That's okay. a really good question though. And this is a quick follow-up. Would would you recommend avoiding fields that have waterfowl in them, even if you're going for upland game bird? 
Oh my God. I, I mean, personally, this is, I can't speak for WDF, WDFW on this. Jenna and I were talking about this earlier. Personally, I would probably avoid what areas with waterfowl at this point. Um, just based on the, the prevalence and the potential impact rate. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that is a good question. I think it's a, it's a risk assessment that you have to do for yourself, right? And your birds. Um, and if you're, yeah, if your bird's not coming in contact with the waterfowl themselves or the feces or the water that they are in, then the exposure risk should be quite low. Um, if you see upland game birds that are sick and or exhibiting symptoms, gosh, let us know. I, I think that they would be susceptible to this. I know, right, you know, this time last year, we were looking to do sharp tail grouse imports from British Columbia. Um, and we were trying to eat them in to the state before high path AI was documented. Um, and, and the thought was, you know, if, if they're positive, they're gonna be sick or dead, just given what we know of, of the virus and how it affects close relatives. Um, so if you're, if you're up there hunting <laughs> from upland game birds and you see sick or dead birds, let us know for sure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Susan. <laughs> yeah, I've been collecting questions. I feel like, you know, to that effect, is that blue eye that we saw in one of the slides, one of the more distinct sy symptoms? of avian influenza. I mean, because, it, yeah, go ahead. Well, just because, you know, there's other afflictions birds can have that'll cause, you know, right. respiratory, labored respiration and mm -hmm. uh, things that look similar, you know? Yeah, I would, I would be more concerned with neurologic symptoms. Um, okay. That 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 blue you know eye with the ocular opacity. I think um, it's we're starting to see it a lot in the waterfowl that are being reported right now. That's why I put that picture in because of yeah. you know up at, at Weiser Lake with the the goose mortality event. One hundred percent of the dead geese have those that cloudy eye. Okay. Um, but I would be I would look more for neurologic symptoms, right? Tremors, the head you know turning the head back and not being able to bring it back and stand up straight. Um, a lot of these birds can't stand up. You can see, I mean, I've got a video, it's a heartbreaking video of a, of a bald eagle um, that can't, you know, it can't stand up. It's in a dog crate and it's just like falls flat on its face and tries to stand up. So those types of neurologic symptoms, I think would be what I'd be looking for more than, than anything. No, that's helpful. Thank you. And um, what about uh, like rodents, like mice, rats, uh, you know, voles, uh, those sorts of things? Um, you know, we don't normally hunt those, but I do sometimes have kestrels and falcons that catch mice mm -hmm. in the field. Mm -hmm. And then I was also wondering about like songbirds. We're not supposed to hunt a lot of them, a lot of them, but like a starling, for example, even or sparrows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are really, really great questions, and I don't have good answers. I mean, I can tell you what we know from historic information, right? And and that you know we avian or influenza can infect rodents, um, but we haven't seen mortality events in rodents associated with this. Um, you know, if the if if you're hunting at the edge of like a lake or something where there's a lot of waterfowl, maybe be safer or be safe and consider that. Um, you may not be there because of <laughs> the waterfowl and the risk anyways. Um, but we just, at this point, we don't know, but we're not looking either, right? So I, I can yeah. say based on, on data that we have from the past, probably safe, probably okay. Um, but, you know, there there is an element of unknown. As far as songbirds, I think that's also an element of unknown. We don't we don't tend to think of high path AI as, as involving songbirds, right? We haven't recommended that people take down their bird feeders because we don't think songbirds are a reservoir and spreading it, right? But again, we haven't tested them. Um, yeah. There have been a couple studies that, you know, exposure type studies that show that they, some species of songbird can be, you know, probably could serve as a reservoir, but we're, we're just not seeing that on the landscape, right? So, I, I mean, I think the I think the risk is pretty low, but again, that's based on, you know, knowledge of previous strains of high path AI and, 
not necessarily this this new strain that's that's circulating more. I, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm giving you not good answers to those questions. We don't no, have great that, data. You know, it I think, makes sense. I, I just haven't really, uh, to be honest, looked at a lot of the research either. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they tend to stay up high. They're not on the mm -hmm. ground for their species as, as much. Um, right. So. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that, I mean, there may, based on current knowledge and my understanding, I think the risk would be pretty low. And again, it goes back to, you know, we're not advising people to take down their bird feeders. We're not worried about people having their bird feeders up and having domestic chickens, right? We tell them to keep their chickens locked in. That's more to limit the exposure with, with waterfowl and, and other birds, not, not songbirds. Thank you. No, um, so two more things real quick to my point. Um, uh, I have worked as a veterinary writer, as kind of like a veterinary mm -hmm. tech writer. Mm -hmm. and um, at different levels, national, state. And um, I think there's kind of an apex with the state veterinary associations and the uh, state wildlife departments and then uh, in, in Pullman specifically for the colleges of veterinary medicine. So there's kind of a possibility there, I think of some kinds of partnerships with falconers because you know falconers also serve in the veterinary colleges or in the state. So, you know, I think there's um, there's possibilities there for both the vaccination campaigns mm -hmm. and for more research. You know, I think they're the best equipped. Um, I don't have a bird in my possession right now, but if I did, that's what I would be doing is going to the vet that I normally would go to, who inevitably would probably have connections to the state VMA and most likely a veterinary college of some sort, even if just an alma mater. So I just wanted to throw that out there that there's kind of already a, um, an infrastructure, I think, for this sort of thing. And I'm not telling a lot of you anything you don't know, but um, I just wanted to emphasize that. And then finally, um, I only have flown passage birds. So at some point I might hold on to a bird for three, four years, but then I do uh, release it. So I'm a little bit concerned uh, about the daunting possibility of having uh, a bird for life because you know that could be 25 years. So um, was I clear on hearing that you were saying that if your bird was vaccinated, it would not be releasable, or is that just kind kind of coming up in the milieu of conversation right now? That's correct. That's a, that's a, that's yeah. A, yeah. I guess Bill could speak to that, but yeah, it, it was a it was part of their appeal to the to that international body. Okay. Yeah, so that um, that's what I was told. Um, they want um, trackability of the bird for life. And I brought up the, um, the idea that, you know, some of us, I mean, I um, have a passage peregrine right now and I may want to release the bird at some point. Um, but anyway, I brought that fact up that we sometimes trap a bird, fly it for a season and let it go. And the response I got back um, at this juncture was, well, it may be that not all your birds can be vaccinated then. Okay, because I think it's kind of integral to, to falconry to have that option. I mean, um, you know, for those of us who've had a few birds and I've had a, a, only a few, but um, you know, there is a difference when you purchase a bird that was bred um, it's a different experience than trapping the passage bird. And, you know, it's almost like two trajectories within the sport or, you know, the discipline. So that's all I've, I've said my piece on that, but I think that's a lot to unpack. And, you know, I would, I would definitely advocate for us uh, having a, a way to still fly passage birds. So, okay, I'll lower my hand. <laughs> Josh? Uh, just quick follow-up. So was that having that bird for the rest of your life, was that for the vaccine of the H, pardon my ignorance for this, the, I believe <laughs> H5N1, or was that with the H5N2 vaccine or either? I think any, any mm -hmm. vaccine. Yep. Any vaccine. Okay. And additionally, is there any way we can get a copy of this PowerPoint? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And I, yeah, I guess I, Jen, 
I can't read teams because I'm screen sharing and I'm limited, but it looks like Jen's mentioning that we can release vaccinated other wild animals. Um, but I think the the catch here is that this is not an approved vaccine for use in the United States. And so it would be under a special use permit. Um, and because of the potential imports, I, if I hopefully, you know, if the USDA moves to vaccinating domestic poultry as well, then this won't be an issue, right? It wouldn't be something that I, I, I mean, I would like to think that it wouldn't be an issue, right? If the world in general starts to move towards vac vaccination of poultry um, and the trade regulations aren't of concern, um, then eventually it may be that we can vaccinate wild birds and release them back, right, and not have to worry about it. Um, but, yeah, which circles back to Paul's question about vaccinating endangered species, right, under this, you know, how it is right now, we can't, we wouldn't be able to do that unless we got special permission. Right, I think... Are there any other questions or comments or thoughts about vaccination? I, I think I'm done. I have one more slide, which was repetitive. So I'm going to skip it and go to the questions, but we've already been doing questions. <laughs> so are there any more questions, thoughts, comments, anything folks want to talk about? Hey, I see on the chat, there's a lot of people saying thank you very much. This is very informative mm -hmm. as well done. Thank you, uh, Katie.